The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Charney and this is the Leon Charney Report and I have just read a fascinating book if you really want to understand what went on in the United States between uh, Russia the Soviet Union the whole world you got to read this book it is called from the shadows and I don't recommend books that often I did recommend a few but I'd say that this one really gives you the history of America behind the scenes that you will not get from any other book that I've read and I've been through part of this uh, action so to speak we have a man called Robert Gates, the former CIA director who served five presidents, 11 secretaries of state, and God knows how many national security people. Bob, it's an honor to have you on the show, and, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. I couldn't put the book down. It was tremendous. I mean, you worked for five presidents, and you diagnosed them in a sense. Uh, it, it's impeccable. Now, I had a lot to do with Jimmy Carter, so the first thing I want to do is tell me what you thought of Jimmy Carter. I found that he was personally the least approachable uh, other than Nixon. I didn't really know Nixon very well, but of those that I knew reasonably well, I found Carter uh, to be the, the most difficult to get to know and the most distant. But I also thought that he was the smartest president that I worked for, and he was probably the hardest working president uh, that I worked for. A little penurious, though, wasn't he? He was, actually, I make the point, he was the tightest fisted president with a, with a dollar, with the taxpayer's dollar, of any of the ones that I worked for, whether it was defense or domestic affairs. I saw occasions when his Secretary of State, his Secretary of Defense, his head of CIA, and his National Security Advisor would all come in to him with a recommendation to spend five or ten million dollars on something, and he would say no, because it was too much money. He was, he was very fiscally conservative. He still is, by the way. <laughs> I think he goes, if he, if he can, he goes tourist class when he flies. He's unbelievable. But uh, you sort of revisit his foreign policy. You give him a lot more credit than, than the uh, public has given him, especially with the Soviet Union. Uh, you talk about uh, he, he understood what was going on in Afghanistan way before, and he supported some rebels there. He did some work in South America. I mean, a lot of people don't notice about Jimmy Carter. This is a whole element of uh, President Carter's foreign policy that has remained secret up until this book. And partly it's because uh, the people who were involved in the Carter administration wrote their memoirs a long time ago, long before there was any willingness to make many of these things public. And so my timing uh, helps in that respect because there's some distance. But the bottom line is that he pursued policies toward the Soviet Union, both overtly and covertly, that were much tougher than appeared to be the case at the time. Just to use the examples that you were referring to, he began uh, authorizing covert actions against the Soviet Union uh, as early as March 1977, within two months after he took office. Uh, he authorized a considerable increase in CIA's program to smuggle into the Soviet Union uh, literature, uh, books, periodicals, video cassettes, uh, and so on, uh, bringing the words of Soviet dissidents to the Soviet people as well as information about the misdeeds of their government, about their national culture, uh, and particularly for the minority ethnic groups, uh, and, and the uh, literature about democracy. And even in the third world, as early as 1978, he was formulating strategies to try and deal with Soviet aggression in the third world. Ironically, in 1978, he was blocked by CIA and the State Department that didn't want to get involved in, uh, in covert Stan action. Stansfield Turner was, the, uh, it was his head of the CIA. That's correct. And, and then by 1979, by early 1979, Carter was really uh, underway. And 
even before the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, under with President Carter's authorization, CIA was undertaking covert actions to counter the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, to help the government in El Salvador uh, resist uh, the infiltration of uh, Sandinista weapons. Um, and, and six months before the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, uh, Carter was uh, authorizing covert assistance to the Mujahideen. So there's a, there's a record there of actions on the secret side and the shadow wars, if you will, uh, that really has remained secret up until this time. Where were you during the uh, Iran hostage crisis? I was uh, actually, I left the White House within a couple of months of, uh, of that to go back to CIA. I served uh, from early in 1977 until the end of 1979 uh, in, as uh, Dr. Brzezinski's assistant. Maybe you can answer this, since I worked on Camp David. Uh, have you ever seen a president take 13 days of his presidency and go to Camp David and try and make an agreement between two countries and then travel to the Middle East as he did at the final leg and go to Jerusalem and then Cairo and, 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 and do uh, this Herculean job? A, what compelled him to do it? And B, uh, have you ever seen anything in history? Or have you read anything in history like this? No, I, I, I don't. I haven't, and and I don't think there's any precedent for it. Uh, the only the only thing even compar remotely comparable to it was uh, President Roosevelt's uh, Theodore Roosevelt's uh, mediation of the Russo-Japanese War back in 1905, for which he got the Nobel Prize, by the way. Jimmy hasn't got. <laughs> he hasn't got his yet, uh, but but I think you know people will uh, can understand or grasp the commitment of time and so on. I think what may have uh, uh, eluded people was the incredible amount of political risk that he took. Uh, the odds were so much against that agreement and to make that kind of commitment of American and presidential prestige to a process where the outcome was so uncertain, very few presidents are willing to make that, take that kind of a risk. We didn't know each other then, but you were probably in a King David Hotel in Jerusalem sitting with the President and Dr. Brzezinski and uh, the Secretary of State Vance, and then Carter made a decision to stay another 24 hours. Do you remember that? Yes. All the wheels started to move. And then we had to land at Cairo Airport on our way home to finalize the deal. To finalize the deal. The deal. Uh, it's an amazing story. We lived through it. Mr. Nixon. What was your opinion of Mr. Nixon? Well, I think that, that um, I characterize the period of detente uh, in the book as the era of smoke and mirrors. And the reason is that while the rhetoric was of uh, building a new relationship with the Soviet Union, of building an enduring peace and so on, in fact, <clears throat> during that period, Neither side ever missed a single opportunity to try and extract a unilateral advantage from the other. Neither side ever gave up a single strategic offensive weapon. Uh, the reality is that the adversarial, confrontational nature of the relationship continued even though after 1972 both Nixon and uh, Henry Kissinger tried to minimize that. There were some benefits from detente, some very important benefits. One was the agreement on Berlin that essentially eliminated the city as a flashpoint in the Cold War for the rest of the Cold War. Another was the process, the dialogue involved in the arms control negotiations on nuclear weapons and nuclear strategy, a, a process, a dialogue that I think became much more important than the agreements that resulted from it, at least on the offensive side. And finally, detente opened up the Soviet Union to a flow of officials, journalists, scientists, cultural groups, uh, and finally tourists that began to erode Soviet information control. So I think there were some real benefits to detente, but I also think that it was mischaracterized at the time, and that was the reason the disillusionment with it set in in 1974, 75, and 76. And on a personal level, you say that uh, Nixon was sort of a, a soft guy on the inside and a tough guy on the outside? Well, this is a guy, and I draw the contrast with President Carter. 
Nixon, as so many books have described, absolutely dreaded personal confrontation or saying negative things to people or whatever. And one of the reasons that he, his White House door was so guarded was because he was always afraid of being put in a position where he'd have to say something like that or confront or be confronted by somebody. In contrast, President Carter, who appeared so soft on the outside, was iron-willed and, and unlike any president that I witnessed and worked for, uh, he was more than willing to criticize and to dress down his most senior associates, uh, even at the cabinet level. I mean, he did not shrink from uh, that kind of confrontation and, and personal encounter. I'll tell you a story, and I agree with you. <coughs> we were at a White House reception, and uh, uh, this was for the Jewish uh, celebration of Israel or something. There were 500 people in the White House, and Carter sent a Marine to talk to me because he wanted me to convey a message to Azar Weitzman, who was then Defense Secretary about Lebanon. And the Marine came to me and said, Mr. Charney, the President would like to see you. I said, yes, sir. And I walked over. And then uh, there was another high official. I won't name him. There. He said, Mr. President, would you like me to come with you? And he, those blue eyes, remember those blue staring? When he gave you those blue eyes, he just said no. And that was the end of this guy. He disappeared. So, And he put his arm around me and he said, uh, I just want to tell you that I appreciate what you're doing. And to get affection, in a sense, from Carter, you really had to earn it. I mean, he just wouldn't give it. To get any, he was penurious even in his praise unless you really deserved it. The guy was a truthful man. He just, uh, he wasn't going to give you a lot of baloney. But I agree with you. If you saw those, those eyes, those blue eyes came right out of his sockets and that was the end of you. You were finished. We got a cut for a commercial break. We'll come right back with Robert Gates, the former CIA, CIA director who's written a book called From the Shadows. My prediction is it will be a bestseller. Everybody has to read this book if you want to see the history of the United States. Through the eyes of a man who saw it for the past 25 years. We'll be right back. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time. The 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time. And its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high. To have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Now get the book the hit movie was based on, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the backdoor channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty. Become a witness to history and order backdoor channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order backdoor channels. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the Diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening. A book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. Available now over iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play. Leon Charney's cantorial CD in Disco Long. Listen as Charney movingly sings El Mole Rachamim and Charney's amazing rendition of a disco remix of Adon Olam, all sung in the incredible and individual Charney style. Also listen to the CDs on Rhapsody. Download Leon Charney's cantorial songs in Disco Lam, the disco remix of Adon Olam on Amazon, iTunes, and Google Play. Or listen in on Rhapsody, all available now. We're back with Robert Gates, the former CIA director who's written an intriguing and compulsive and compulsive book. You must read it. It's called From the Shadows. And uh, I read it last night. I stayed up all night. That's why I look a little weary today. 
You come up with some uh, wonderful remarks about President Ford. You uh, think he was understated and uh, not as revered as he should have been. That's correct. I think that, uh, that he is uh, considerably underestimated. Here's a president that, that people portrayed as not being terribly uh, bright, but he's a guy who impressed people like Giscard d'Estaing of France and uh, Chancellor Schmidt of Germany, not only with his understanding of politics, but of international economics. And both of these guys were former finance ministers and, and pretty tough to impress. But where I think he has not gotten the credit he deserves is in his signing of the 1975 Helsinki Agreement, the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe. And particularly because of the human rights uh, elements of that declaration, because now scholars are beginning to understand that that declaration in 1975 marked really the beginning of the end in the, of the Soviet Empire because dissidents in Eastern Europe and in the Soviet Union both used the fact that their governments had pledged to uphold certain standards in human rights in that declaration to organize and to publicize the failure of their governments to pay attention and the roots of solidarity and of Charter 77 in Czechoslovakia and these other groups whose leaders are now the leaders of those countries, those free and democratic countries, are found in that Helsinki Declaration. Ford knew exactly what he was doing in signing it. Sometimes you do these things and you don't realize the implications, right. but as early as 1979, long before any of this was apparent, in his memoirs, Ford wrote that he saw this coming and saw the potential impact of this declaration. And, and the reality is that uh, he took tremendous heat for, uh, for it from conservatives and Americans of East European descent who felt that he had essentially signed up to a Yalta II. And the newspapers criticized him for going. They criticized him for signing. The New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal had an editorial that said, "Jerry, don't go." <laughs> and and his own staff thought he was being suckered by Henry Kissinger into signing this thing. And in reality, it probably cost him the election in 1976. But he thought it was the right thing to do, and it did mark the beginning of the end of the empire. Bob, did he pardon Nixon in order to keep the United States a stable country throughout the world, or was it just a personal decision, in your I, opinion? I worked at the White House at the time. I was on the National Security Council staff, and I always believed that President Ford uh, pardoned Nixon because he felt that after the agony of Vietnam and Watergate, that a trial and continuing this keeping this uh, sore open and continuing to have this problem would drain whatever capacity the country had to deal with the international challenges and its problems at home. I, I'm convinced that right or wrong that he did it because he believed it was the best thing for the country, not because it was the best thing for Richard Nixon. And probably because, uh, <coughs> well, uh, what a lot of Americans don't understand is that everybody looks up to America, and if they see the system here wobbly, they get very nervous. I mean, you bet on anybody, you get CIA reports on it all the time, and what they want to see is a credible United States. Otherwise, everything starts to shake, and they perceive a weakening. So I guess in, in the terms of historical uh, 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 strength, I guess he did the right thing for it. And he probably blew the election on that too. I think that was a big issue at that point. But the key is that these guys, and it's true of all of them, showed a courage, a political courage, that they almost never got credit for at the time, but is so much clearer in retrospect. Yeah, well your book brings that out in a lot of ways. And let's talk about aw shucks Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Very bright, shrewd guy. He looked like he was a great uh, GE salesman, but he wasn't. He was a pretty shrewd operator, wasn't he? I think that just as the historian Stephen Ambrose has uh, has taken the presidency of Dwight Eisenhower and shown that, that the sort of image of the grandfatherly, genial old Ike who was manipulated by John Foster Dulles and so on is totally wrong, that mm -hmm. Eisenhower really ran that show, that at least in terms of the first term, of President Reagan that future historians will reevaluate him. If you read George Shultz's memoirs, it is clear that all of the critical key strategic decisions in terms of the Soviet Union at least 
were made by Ronald Reagan, not by people around him, not by Schultz and so on. And that and at times Schultz would go too far out on a limb and Reagan would pull him back. At times Cap Weinberger would go too far out and Reagan would pull him back. And here is Reagan, the, the champion of, uh, of the defense buildup, of these covert wars across the third world, uh, challenging the Soviet Union at every turn. But it is Reagan who has the wisdom, once that defense buildup is well underway, who says this isn't an end in itself, it's a means to an end, and the end is a more peaceful world. And now that we've regained our strength, now that we've regained our confidence, now is the time to begin arms control negotiations. Now is the time to begin doing deals with the Soviets. And I cite instances in the book where he will turn to Schultz and say, you can go this far, but not this, not any farther in your negotiations with the Soviets, and then turn to Cap Weinberger and say, but after this meeting, we are going to begin to make concessions. So he really was a very bright guy. I mean, most people think that he was a, he's a genial type of guy who was programmed by a lot of different people. Your book refutes that totally. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to make a case that this was a guy who labored hard in the intellectual vineyard, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Uh, but he had good and, common sense. and I'm not going to say that this is a guy who had command of a lot of details, uh, a lot of specifics. Certainly not anything of the order of on the order of a Jimmy Carter, but but the reality is he had a great strategic sense, and he had a and he had a strategic vision, and a historical optimism that that also were combined were combined with a great sense of negotiating timing. And, and I just think he combined these in a way that allowed the United States, first of all, significantly to increase the pressure on a Soviet Union in crisis, and then take advantage of that crisis to lock in some very significant advantages for the West and for the United States. So was it instinct or impulse? I mean, I'm sure he wasn't a great reader. I'm sure he was not a, a great student. But something about him clicked. I mean, he, he was able to move things. I think that I think a good part of it was instinct. I think he, frankly, had a lot of help uh, from Schultz. I, I say in the book that I think the two of them forged the most productive relationship between a president and a secretary of state since Harry Truman and George Marshall. Because Schultz found the specific ways, the specific uh, channels to uh, translate Reagan's strategy and Reagan's vision into concrete policy. And so it was a very productive relationship, it seems That's to smart. me. Smart. Tell me about Bill Casey. <laughs> Casey was probably the most intellectually lively person I ever worked for. He read more, uh, met with more diverse people of every political stripe, businessmen, wackos, you name it. He would, if you had an idea and you wanted to get in Casey's door, you were in. And he had a better ability than anybody I've ever met to sift through all of the chaff and pick out the one or two kernels of nuggets of information in a conversation that would make it worth his while. Casey came to the agency with a unique uh, objective. He didn't come to run the agency better, to manage it more efficiently, to make CIA a better participant in the policy process, uh, make intelligence more relevant, or any of those things that the rest of us generally did. Casey came to CIA with one objective, and that was to wage war against the Soviet Union. And he was Reagan's instrument in waging that uh, covert conflict around the world. The curious thing about Casey with all these covert actions is that there was only one that got him in trouble. Uh, the covert actions in Afghanistan, in Angola, in Cambodia, uh, everywhere around the world were done pretty much by the book, had considerable congressional support, uh, and, and were really fairly non-controversial. Central America was the problem. And I don't know to this day why Casey became so obsessed with it. I mean, it was a serious problem. Uh, there's no question about that. But why he became so zealous about it and was willing to bend the rules in terms of how that conflict was conducted, uh, I really have never understood. Um, I think, that, uh, I think that the book presents a pretty balanced account of Casey, both in terms of what he brought to the agency, but also the costs that he imposed. And one of the points that I make is that from the day he arrived on the job, 
Bill Casey was guilty of contempt of Congress, <laughs> <laughs> and and it and it manifested That's a nice itself. Way to start. And, and it manifested itself in every conceivable way. He clearly found stroking those guys, keeping them informed, doing what was his job, which was cooperating with the congressional overseers. He just found that a waste of his time and. And, the, and his contempt for them was very quickly reciprocated. That's a great and in that respect, he imposed a considerable cost on the agency. Do you hear the name Amir Amnir? Yes. Do you hear the name uh, Kimchi? Oh, yes. Do you hear the Iran-Contra affair? Yeah. Was Israel involved in this thing or not? Very much so at the beginning. Uh, it was... Um, um, David Kimke, I think, who originally persuaded Bud he was McFarlane. A former, he was a former Mossad operator. <clears throat> that persuaded Bud McFarlane that, that we could get our hostages out in exchange for uh, selling uh, weapons or allowing Israel to sell weapons to the Iranian government. After the fall, after the end of 1985, Israel basically dropped out of the picture. And everything that happened after that was, was done strictly inside the U.S. government. But but the, the origins, the roots of the Iranian arms deal from Kim uh, are from Israel. And the, and the interesting thing is CIA was reporting all through 1985 that there were no moderates in Iran, especially when it came to the United States. But Bud McFarlane chose to believe what he was hearing from Kim Ki and other Israelis to the contrary and basically ignored what the CIA analysis was. So was it a tragedy, the whole thing? The whole thing was a tragedy. It was a terrible mistake. Um, and, um, and a high price was paid. And did Reagan know or he didn't know? Nobody knows. Who knows? Lapse of memories. We'll cut for a commercial break. It's fascinating. You should stay with us. We're going to do a telethon on this book. <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's called From the Shadows, Robert Gates, one of the most impressive books I've read. So we'll see you right after commercial. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high. To have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Now get the book the hit movie was based on, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the Backdoor Channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian Peace Treaty. Become a witness to history and order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order Backdoor Channels. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the Diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening, a book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. Available now over iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play. Leon Charney's cantorial CD in Disco Long. Listen as Charney movingly sings El Molay Rachamim and Charney's amazing rendition of a disco remix of Adon Olam, all sung in the incredible and individual Charney style. Also listen to the CDs on Rhapsody. Download Leon Charney's cantorial songs in Disco Lam, the disco remix of Adon Olam on Amazon, iTunes, and Google Play. Or listen in on Rhapsody, all available now. We're back. Uh, we're here with Robert Gates. He's published From the Shadows. It's a tremendous book. I've been plugging it all the whole show, but believe me, believe me, 
believe me, you've got to buy this book, The Three Beliefs. <laughs> That's like Islamic belief. All right, we've covered all the president except George Bush, and then we're going to go on to other things like what the CIA is all about, how it operates, how a young man from Indiana gets uh, recruited by the CIA. How does it work? I mean, no one knows much about the CIA. George Bush, you tell me, had the best security, national security team ever assembled. He had Scowcroft, he had Powell, he had uh, Cheney, Cheney Baker. Baker, the whole, the whole bowl of wax. So what went wrong? Why did he lose the election? I think, you know, I'm no expert on U.S. domestic affairs, but I, I think the conventional I wisdom is. <laughs> <laughs> I think the conventional wisdom is probably right. He failed to persuade the American people that he could deal as, effect as effectively with their domestic problems as he had dealt with the foreign problems. And I think there was a premature sense in 1992 that we didn't have any foreign problems anymore, and maybe we'll talk about that later. But, but I think that that Bush's great strength was in the. I don't think we've ever had a president who was better at manage at hands-on day-to-day management of foreign policy. And given the period he was president, it was a perfect fit because he had just one crisis after another cascading on one another from the revolutions in Eastern Europe to uh, the reunification of Germany to the ending of the Cold War the, and the collapse of the Soviet Union. And frankly, I believe that Bush's statecraft and his relationships with foreign leaders and the way he managed that whole time made a very unstable revolutionary period seem a lot less dangerous than it really was. When you think that the Soviet Union, that there was no precedent in history for an empire so huge, so old, and so dangerously well armed to collapse so fast, I mean the potential for instability and for civil war, for nuclear conflict inside Russia and so on. People didn't think much about that because it all seemed to flow so smoothly and I think they don't really appreciate the role that Bush played in helping it go smoothly. Where were you during the Gulf War? I was Deputy National Security Advisor. And uh, was the Gulf War, uh, was it the correct thing to do? Absolutely. I think that uh, <coughs> it was the right thing to do to uh, liberate Kuwait, to wreck the offensive arm of the Iraqi army. Uh, I think that the other correct thing to do, and I give Jim Baker and the, and the President a huge amount of credit for this, was understanding the value in building a large international coalition uh, to go with us to do the job. Who, talking about Jim Baker, in your opinion, you work for 11 Secretaries of State. <clears throat> Who was the most impressive? Of those that, that I worked for, I think that, that the two, that I would choose two, I think uh, Henry Kissinger and George Shultz were probably, uh, were probably the two who had, who combined a, an ability to deal with the day-to-day -day problems uh, with uh, a strategic vision, a sense of strategic priorities, a, a geopolitical sense of the world. Of all of them, I think probably Baker was the best negotiator. We saw him in Madrid. We saw the way he put those people together. And basically the foundation for the peace process today, well, first is Camp David and second is Madrid. Yes. When he schlepped uh, Shamir to sit at that table, I don't know if you were there, but you surely knew what was happening. And uh, Shamir sat at that table and we were there. And uh, the Palestinians at that time were taking a direct order from Arafat. And Shamir was playing around with the concept that uh, these were, uh, quote, the Jerusalem Israeli Arabs who were sitting at that table, and it was a ploy. I mean, everybody knew it was coming. Which brings me to another subject. Mr. Arafat, you think this man is on the road to peace? Oh. I think that there is no example anywhere in the world of the impact of the collapse of the Soviet Union that is comparable to the impact in the, in the Middle East. For so many years, the Soviet Union was the chief political supporter, armorer, and cash cow for both the PLO and Syria. And it is not an accident, as the Soviets used to say, that within months of the Soviet collapse, the PLO began making noises about talking to Israel and that Syria began expressing some. They, they were later. Assad came later, but, but he has no alternative. There is no place to go. If, if 82 Syrian planes get shot down today. 
He's they're gone, irreplaceable. He's, that's right, his Air Force. Nobody's going to give them to him like the Soviets did. And so these guys, I think, have a sense, their sense of self-preservation, their sense of political survival as such, that I think it impels them in this direction. And I think that I, I am very impressed by Arafat's ability in the middle of this difficulty, of this violence in the Middle East right now, his ability to get the Palestinian National Council to rescind uh, the part of their charter that calls for the destruction of Israel. Did they rescind it or did they agree to rescind it? Well, I'm not sure, but, but, the, uh, but to because make I that spoke political to, initiative. I spoke to some people yesterday from Likud, mainly uh, people like Benny Begin and uh, uh, big names in the Likud. They said that what he agreed to do was sort of a letter of intent, that he will do it in futuro, but he agreed to do it. So uh, it's a, it's a six-month lapse because I know there's going to be a big problem with Jerusalem. I mean, yeah. he wants to include something in those clauses. Uh, let's go back to the CIA. That's a fascinating topic. Can a president of the United States control the CIA? Well, no, he has to share it with the Congress now. <laughs> now the key is, no, he has to share that control with the Congress. One of the effects of the congressional investigations in 1974-75 was that they discovered that the things that CIA had done that most bothered them had been ordered by the president. CIA was not a rogue elephant operating on its own. It was controlled by the president, and that was the problem. And so what they did was essentially dilute the president's authority over CIA and give Congress a much greater say in how the agency is used. Uh, a new oversight process was created that is much more intrusive. I would guess today that the congressional committees know more about the CIA budget than anybody in the executive branch. Certainly was that case when I was director. And, and so he has to share that control. But, but the notion of CIA as kind of out of control or some kind of a rogue agency was put to bed in 1976. And if anything, it has gotten more cautious since then. Do, is it tough to get new recruits for the CIA today? or is Quite the contrary. The last year I was director, uh, CIA had a few hundred openings, and we received over 150,000 applications uh, or inquiries of intent, uh, desire to apply. Statistically, some, one of my, one of my uh, recruiting officers told me, he said, statistically, it's 20 times harder to get into CIA than to get into Harvard College. Is that right? Is it the food or the salary? <laughs> <laughs> it's neither, I assure you. It's, it is uh, the challenge, the excitement. One of the things, I always went back to CIA after my assignments at the White House because despite the allure of defense and state and some of the other places, I never found another agency in the government where a young person could rise quickly based solely on performance, and where you could displace a much more senior person if you were better than they were. Really? And, and, I, and I always felt that upward mobility, if you will, was, was much easier in CIA for people who were good than any place else in the government. So it's meritocracy. I mean, if you deserve it, you, you rise. Well, I, it, it worked for me, and I saw it work for a lot of people. I wouldn't claim that CIA does not have a lot of bureaucratic aspects, and the book is no uh, sort of self-serving defense of CIA. There's a lot in this book about the CIA's problems and its bureaucracy, and in fact, I wrote Casey a memo in 1981 saying the CIA is becoming like the Department of Agriculture. There are too many people here who have lost the spark, who have retired in place. So. It has its problems, but certainly more than any other government agency, I found it a place where, where merit was recognized. Okay, the big question. How did that uh, spy, what's his name? Uh, Aldrich James. Aldrich James. You write about him in your book? I do. I, I, first of all, I think people should not <clears throat> have ever been surprised that there was a mole in CIA. I mean, every other American national security organization has been penetrated the military departments, the National Security Agency, um, and so on. The real tragedy is that the guy was able to operate in place for so long. And there, there have been 
there have been lots of studies, lots of uh, arguments, uh, lots of statistics and things put forward about why it happened, how it happened, and so on. I think it's really fairly simple. I think over the years, culminating in the mid-1980s, there was a hubris, a pride, at C a false pride at CIA that they couldn't be penetrated. They watched all these other agencies and all these other departments deal with penetrations by the Soviets, and since they hadn't found any, and since our counterintelligence operations and our recruits of, from the KGB couldn't tell us about any agents in CIA, they convinced themselves that there weren't any. There weren't any moles, weren't any penetrations. They also excessively relied on the polygraph. If you passed the polygraph, you were in. They got lazy about counterintelligence. And the combination of that investigative laziness together with the hubris created the conditions in which an Aldrich Ames, with all of the telltale signs that something was wrong, lasted for uh, as long as he did. But the good news in all of that is that illusion that the agency couldn't be penetrated has been shattered. And now I think they take so these they things much more seriously. Compliance. And they will be much more serious about investigating things as well as uh, using the polygraph. Do you know anything about uh, this Pollard case, or you don't touch that at all? Well, I, you know, I mean, no, I, I know what the circumstances are. But that's not your agency. That was, uh, well, that's it was right. naval. They, it was naval uh, intelligence. It was navy. And uh, do you think uh, that this guy should be paroled after ten years, or you don't really? Well, know? I don't know the specifics of the case, but I, you know, uh, what I what I look at is that successive administrations have have reviewed it, including the Clinton administration, that looked at it very closely, and the Justice Department, Janet Reno, recommended uh, that they not that they not change the, the situation. Noriega, you read about him? No, no. The focus of the book is primarily on the U.S.-Soviet. Uh, uh, relationship during those uh, those five presidencies and even the Persian Gulf I deal with only in the context of the Soviet role. So that'll be your second book. <laughs> yeah. Go through a bunch of personalities. I guess so. The uh, how about uh, blacks and women? Are, are they uh, uh, are they are they introduced or do, uh, can they be recruited or are they recruited? The agency has made tremendous progress in hiring women, uh, but it is. They're really, one of the problems that the agency's leaders have to deal with is that there are really four cultures in the agency. There's the analytical side, there's the operational side, the scientific and technical side, and the administrative side. The analytical side of the agency made huge progress in hiring women. I would say at the time I was director, half of the new hires in the analytical side of CIA, half or more, were women, and many of the, uh, of the uh, senior officials in the analytical side are women. The dr operations directorate has had a much worse record, uh, just to take the two key parts of the agency. The operations directorate has had a much more difficult time uh, culturally in dealing with A, recruiting women, and B, moving them up the pipeline quickly. It's slowly beginning to happen but I think they're pretty far behind the power curve. Partly it was a, <clears throat> I think, a paternalistic approach where the, the people who ran the Directorate of Operations or the senior officials in it felt that it was too dangerous to send women into the Middle East, into a lot of third world countries, into the real spy business, which is where careers are made and broken in the clandestine service. Uh, and I think only slowly have they come to the realization that in many of these societies, actually a woman case officer can do a lot better than a man because in some of these uh, male-oriented cultures, they don't pay attention to a, whim a woman as much. And so she is able to get into places and listen to conversations and, and deal with people in a way that a man couldn't. The minorities particularly uh, black Americans, has, has been a real problem for the agency. We have worked very hard to try and recruit more blacks, and there are a number of, uh, of blacks. My executive assistant when I was director was an African-American woman, uh, economist, by the way. But um, <clears throat> it has been very difficult, and the agency has tried a lot of different uh, methods, including trying to sponsor co-ops as, as far down as the high school level and college level to try and help pay for part of their education with the commitment to come to the agency. There has been an improvement, but I don't think it's as great as anybody would like. 
Let's talk about the all-star team. Gorbachev, Yeltsin, Primakov. <laughs> <laughs> what a team. Gorby, what do you think of him? I think his tenure as the last Soviet leader is the embodiment of the law of unintended consequences. <laughs> <laughs> this is a guy who set out in 1985 to uh, reform Soviet communism and save the Soviet Union, and instead he ended up destroying it. Uh, he, he destroyed the Stalinist structure that uh, sustained it. He destroyed the fear that allowed the Communist Party to maintain its control. Uh, I wrote Bush a memo in the summer of 1990 urging him not to, when I was Deputy National Security Advisor, urging him not to rely solely on Gorbachev because I felt that, <coughs> that, I told him in the memo that I thought there was a good chance Gorbachev wouldn't be around a year or two after that because of all the problems that he had. And I wrote at the end of the, at the, end of the, mem at the, end of the memo that, that Gorbachev, and, and I realize it's a stretched analogy, but I said Gorbachev is like a Soviet Moses. He has delivered the Soviet peoples from the bondage of Stalinism, but he has not the vision to carry them over to the Promised Land. He didn't understand any kind of economy other than a socialist a communist economy. And he did not understand the, the terrible weakness of his position because he was the only leader in the Soviet Union in 1990 or 1991 who had not been elected. And he, and he structured the elections in a way that he didn't have to go before the electorate. That was a risk Yeltsin was willing to take and has always been willing to take. So Gorbachev Gorbachev's glory is that he destroyed the Stalinist system. His tragedy is he couldn't build something to take its place. And that's why the Soviet Union collapsed. And Yeltsin? Yeltsin is, <clears throat> is not a president in the sense that we understand a president. He doesn't care anything about day-to-day -day administration of the government. Uh, he kind of doesn't pay attention. He disappears for days at a time. Uh, uh, he, he is, shall we say, inattentive to detail. <laughs> and, and, um, uh, but the fact is that he is, however he has slowed down the process of reform, however he has conducted the war in Chechnya, many other problems. They're not fulfilling their obligations under arms control agreements. There are a lot of problems that we have with the Russians, but the reality is, given a choice between Yeltsin and the communist Zhuganov, reform will at least stay alive under Yeltsin. It won't go very far, but it won't die and it won't be reversed. Under the communists, if the communists come back under Zhuganov, I believe it'll be reversed. Not to create a Soviet Union that was the kind of threat that the old Soviet Union was, but one that will be a much more difficult problem for the United States and other nations to manage. My own view is Yeltsin's going to win the election. It would probably be a narrow victory, but I think we have seen since 1990 that every time the Russians went to the polls, this country that hasn't had a democratic life in its thousand-year history has embraced democracy. And every election since 1989-1990, the Russians have tended to vote their hopes rather than their fears. And I think that's going to happen again. Is he a thinker, though, uh, Yeltsin? Does no, I don't think so. No, I think all. I had a secret meeting with uh, Foreign Minister Primakov when he was head of the KGB. Uh, actually, uh, I'm sorry, one, with his predecessor, Khrushchev, the head of the KGB, at a restaurant in Washington during one of the summits. Nobody knew what was going on. It was the highest level CIA KGB summit in history. And, and we were talking about Yeltsin. And Khrushchev leaned across the table to me over his uh, Chevis Regal, and he said, uh, Yeltsin, I hope you don't think he's a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> Yeltsin is a leader of... But if he was drinking Stolichnaya, you might have heard something else, right? <laughs> he, uh, Yeltsin is an authoritarian leader who has enough confidence in himself to run for election. Uh, and then he kind of backs off. He, he's kind of uh, almost thinks of himself as a figurehead, not like, uh, not like we think of a president. Not and, and that's why he really 
doesn't get things accomplished. He doesn't create a political faction in the parliament to support him. He just doesn't do a lot of the things that, that he ought to to try and strengthen democracy in his own program. I think you're right. Uh, we were in, I was in uh, Russia with uh, President Clinton on the last trip, not this one, the one before that, when I had these big parades for the 50th anniversary. And what we did is we went behind the scenes to film the other parade, and everybody was marching with Stalin placards, and everybody was marching with uh, uh, Lenin placards, Backwards. Everybody wanted to go back to the old system because you have people over 50 or 60. That's all they knew. It was their religion. I mean, they wanted to go to and the they're tomb. The, and they're suffering the most. Right, and they are suffering. So there's this tremendous wedge between this uh, new new varish wealthy and this tremendous poor. And I don't know where that winds up. And if Yeltsin's not paying attention, he may win again. But, you know, he switches governments like uh, I switch for baseball teams, you know. <laughs> he just flies around with these guys. And Primakov's a hard-line guy. He's taken different positions than, uh, than his other f uh, foreign ministers. Uh, so I, I think it's unknown what's going to happen in Russia. I mean, uh, it basically, it's, it's nearly a third world country in terms of, his, of its economics. The development there is terrible, uh, Bob. Look, we, you know, the, the governments of both the United States and Russia, I think, uh, give a misleading picture. I mean, they look at the macroeconomics. Uh, uh, they have brought the inflation rate down. They have stabilized the ruble. Uh, some important things have been done in privatization. But you get beneath that, and it's a mess. The life, the living conditions terrible. for most Russians are terrible. terrible. This is a country where the GNP has fallen between a third and a half in the last five years. It's a country with 15 percent real unemployment where they've known no unemployment for three generations. It's a country where the health care system has collapsed. Just give you one example. Uh, the, the explosion of disease in Russia, diphtheria, cholera, tuberculosis, dysentery. There were 2,000 cases of, dis of diphtheria in Russia in 1990. There were 200,000 cases in 1994. Uh, this is a country where a lot of people the are hurting. The medical system is terrible. I mean, it, you're right, and uh, people don't understand it. We saw it, and it was terrible. And I saw it in, in Ukraine also. I mean, uh, a college professor makes $30 a month in Ukraine. Well, and the other side of it is, if you, judging from comments and reports by the Russian Ministry of Foreign External Trade, the Russian Central Bank, and Interpol, 40% of the Russian economy is controlled by organized crime at this I point. Know, it's terrible. Bob, we're going to run out of time. Did you have to get clearance from the CIA to write this book? I did, but uh, times have changed. I changed some of the rules when I was director. <laughs> uh, I ordered the declassification of all of the estimates on the Soviet Union up to 1983 and a part of the new process of openness in the agency. And, and I was very comfortable with the review process. They, they took out very little. Great. By the way, how's the Mossad doing? Are they good? I think they're good. Our people here are very interested in the Mossad. Thank you very much for coming on. If you get a chance to come back this way, I know you live in Thank Washington, you. maybe we'll fly to you, but uh, we'd love to have you again. It's a great book, From the Shadows. It took me all night and I read it, and I told you before, I'm leery and weary, but it was worth it.